Thank you for joining us today, Celeste Hall. Uh, Celeste Hall is a trustee, uh, board member trustee of NCDA in, in K-12, um, and also uh, works diligently at the Virginia Community College System. She's developed training um, and has a focus on helping uh, students make connections uh, to the world of work and helping counselors facilitate that. Uh, so welcome, Celeste. Yes, thank you. Celeste, you spent many years in high school supporting students uh, in their career development and creating experiential learning opportunities within their communities. What is it that you like about SkillsLine is, and has made you want to engage with us um, in conversations around human skills? There are really so many things I like about SkillsLine. I'll try to keep it to three or four. But first of all, the thing I really appreciate about it is the framework that you've provided. Educators need to work from standards and we work from frameworks. So I really like the framework that you provide and those core competencies um, that you start with. And then you give the, you know, the human skills within those competencies you know, the self-agency, the collaboration, results orientation, these things that are important, employability skills for students to develop, you know, because educators have to work from standards for their planning. And when they have that clear framework, that is very helpful for them. So that's the first thing I noticed is just supplying that framework for educators. And you know, I think that for educators, it's very helpful when they have that big picture um, and it relates back to the purpose of the school system and, and what the state boards of education articulate. We, when we first started, we made a very specific intentional decision to create a framework that was flexible and could map to various standards. And two examples that come to mind of that are Jobs for America's Graduates where we looked at the Jobs for America's competencies and we mapped those and mapped skills line to them and we're able to have um, new JAG specialists quickly fulfill the requirements of JAG and the competencies, right? They, right. they teach a skills line lesson um, and they've covered that competency and they can move on to the project learning. Uh, right. The other example uh, that you kind of brought to, to mind as you were talking was in, in Indiana. We've mapped to Indiana employability skills and high schools there, um, you know, in Indianapolis and, and Batesville, the lessons are then mapped to those Indiana employability skill standards yes. um, and really focused on work-based learning experiences and their preparation for them. So that students, when they arrive at an employer or they're thinking about requirements for a work-based learning experience, they're ready. Um, they're ready on, on job one. Yes. Another part of skills line that I really like is the micro lessons because every educator is stressed for time. When you come to the school, you never know what's going to be happening that day. So to have that lesson already in place and it saves so much time for those who are resource people like counselors or career specialists. If you're asking for time out of a classroom, maybe it's an English class, maybe it's a history class. A lot of teachers don't want to give up an hour or a half an hour. They can work you in for 15 minutes, right? So if you have a 10 minute micro lesson that either you can come in and do, or you can ask them to do maybe at the beginning of a class before they jump into their core content, then that is really helpful you know, having those concrete short-term lessons available is just key. One of the, you know, bits of feedback that we've gotten from a number of, of teachers that are looking to integrate this into the classroom um, is that we lift the burden of learning a whole new discipline, right? right. We're able to bring forward the human um, in the discussion and the technology just helps bring that along, brings that knowledge and brings right. that common language to both the learner um, and the teacher, the counselor. And we all start as a group, as a community, using that mm -hmm. same language. One of the things I've, I've heard you comment on before as well is what you've called the Socratic method of, of learning um, and, and the questioning that we do. Yes. Could you comment a bit on that? 
you know, you provide those those questions, those really thought provoking questions for students. And I think you've mentioned before that sometimes students say, nobody's ever asked me a question like that before. Or, you know, you start with one question and then it kind of leads into other questions. So it really allows that self-reflection that we're really trying to get to with career development. Because if we if we go back to the very foundations of career development, it's about knowing, know yourself, and then learn about the world of work. So how do we help students know themselves? So you're, you're providing these kinds of thought questions that allow them to relate uh, what they're learning to their own lives. And when you talk about relating that to their real lives, that makes me think about not only do they relate that to what's going on today, we've also heard from students and and that they're able to bring forward their lived experience in a new language. And they they right. see that what I've had before has been conflict and how did I resolve that conflict? How did I demonstrate resilience? You know, a lot of this, the uh, learners we work with at Jobs for America's graduates, for example, have barriers that they're up against. Yes. And they talk about how they've overcome those barriers in the language of skills. And they start to realize that their lived experience brought forward is valuable in life. And yes. they can describe it. And if, if they learn to do that, that really is the kind of skill that they can take to talking to an employer or eventually in a job interview because they're saying, I have overcome diversity before. I, I can solve problems. And here's an example of how I did that in the past. One of the things we've talked a lot about is, you know, what are these skills and, and what do we call them? And yeah. um, I was curious about your take on that. There seem to be so many different names for these skills out there, right? And the one that you hear the most is probably soft skills, which I have some mixed feelings about that term. I know people recognize that term, but I don't think it's the best descriptor. So I like that you use the term human skills. I wonder if you could give a little feedback too. How did how did you and Courtney decide on using human skills as the term? Human skills came about because we had a reaction as well to the, the term soft skills, right? You know, you look at Simon Sinek and he's like, the last thing soft skills are is soft, right? Or, and right. you hear that, that a lot. It's just a term um, that's sort of come about into you know, common usage. So we saw the shift in, in the economy and technology towards automation, the advent of artificial oh, intelligence. Yes. Okay. Um, and you know, that's been going on for a while. But we thought about human skills as those skills that are uniquely human, right? And we yes. go beyond soft skills. It's not just another name. We go to cultivating agency, cultivating the entrepreneurial mindset, cultivating the belief that uh, my actions matter in the world and that by taking action, I can uh, accomplish goals and thrive in, in this new world. So this world needs the human and we see these skills right. as a unique human advantage in, in the workplace. Um, and that's really uh, what we're hearing quite a bit out there now in, in the literature, in the news, is that the exactly. human skills are absolutely um, the competitive advantage in for life, um, whether yes. it's school, uh, workplace, um, or just generally life. It, human skills are the competitive advantage. And even more so in the last year with all of the attention on artificial intelligence and how that's going to be working into the economy and that sort of thing. And people are thinking about that more. What do we as people bring that computers or artificial intelligence cannot bring? And what is it that really makes us human? You know, all those things that you were talking about, really. Yeah. And how do we as individuals make ourselves valuable to the economy? And how do we take action to, to do that? Um, and these, these uh, human skills are a critical component along with embracing learning, right? We're going to have to right. learn new technical skills all along the way. We've got those human right. skills, which are, you know, durable. They don't have the same half-life that technical skills do. But 
combined human skills with the technical skills. There's a lot of emergent effects on that right. from that combination that make a person more valuable in the workplace and drive social and economic mobility. So we think it's, a, it's an exciting time. If there are more tasks being done by artificial intelligence, then how can we use that extra time that's created in a way that's really going to make the world better? You know, bringing our human skills to that. And, you know, the other part that I tend not to like about soft skills is it makes them seem less important. You know, if you have the hard skills versus the soft skills, it sounds like, well, it's nice if you want to have the soft skills. That's a little fluff or something. And I think it gives a incorrect idea about how important they are. That's right. Sometimes you'll read, you know, human skills are uh, just as important as the technical skills. And the way that I see it is they aren't siloed. They make, you know, human skills and your knowledge, skills, and abilities, the things you've learned, the developed competencies that you have are just as important as those human skills. Right. Meaning that those two together make up, you know, what a person can accomplish and right. um, help us achieve the, those goals of, of economic and social mobility. So I, I agree with you. One of the things that you and I have talked about through our conversations is, you know, the importance of taking charge as a student. And we talk about agency. I was wondering if you could talk right. about what agency means to you and, and why you see that is so important to learners today or people in general throughout their lives. Yeah. And there's always that transition, you know, from high school to beyond and we tend to not do our students a lot of favors in high school, probably by doing too much for them and maybe being too directive in everything that we do instead of saying, hey, you know, you have choices, you have control, you have this agency that, you know, you can make plans and you can make decisions and so on. So and then there's always, you know, the role of the parent in high school, the parent feels like they need to either help their students make decisions or sometimes make decisions for them. And so this idea of helping the student make that transition and take that responsibility as they move forward, you know, I think is very important for students. And, you know, as I look at this list of core competencies, you know, we have the self-agency, the collaboration, higher order thinking intentionality and results orientation. And I was thinking, you know what, even if the students really improve in one or two of those areas, that is a big win. You know, they don't even have to be fully competent in all five. If they improve some or they really focus in on one or two, we're really helping them a great deal. You know, it's interesting you, you say that because what it, it made me think about the intertwined nature of these skills, right? Yeah, you know, it's hard to operate on a team if you don't have self agency or the, you know communication skills, feedback, right? Making decisions in a, in a human world, right? In a human driven, um, you know, where skill these skills are, have become more more important and critical to the jobs of of today and the future. That making decisions is is not done in a silo. It's done through teamwork right. and collaboration. So I, I agree with you. If you pick up one of these, you you know, a couple of the, the competencies and you begin to have that awareness on that foundation right. to develop them, um, you naturally begin to develop the others um, and, and can dive in deeper. So one final question I was going to ask you was you have mentioned helping students develop as a whole person. We've also heard from you know, middle school and high school teachers in the classroom that they're able to see the whole person. And I was wondering, what do you mean by that as the whole person? What does that term mean? Yeah, I guess, you know, when we start to have students go to different classes and different subjects, we tend to start doing that in middle school. And I think we then the teachers start to just focus on their particular subject you know, I'm teaching these students math or I'm teaching them English or history or whatever it is. And so that integration of everything doesn't happen as much. Yeah, but this this idea of bringing in these concepts to really every class and having the teachers in whatever subject it is talk about some of these human skills and how they relate to their subject, 
you know, the student gets to talk about themselves a little bit. They're not just focusing on math equations or grammar or something in that class. They can bring together a lot of different aspects of who they are and how what they're learning can be important to them in the future. Thanks, Celeste. Um, I really appreciate your your time today. We learned a lot from uh, from you as well as the other educators uh, we we work with. It really helps to drive our thinking to have these these types of conversations um, and develop a, a system product um, that's useful useful to educators. So thank you uh, for your time yep. and uh, look forward to our next conversation. Appreciate so much what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Celeste.